This podcast is sponsored by Monarch Money. Have you been using Mint to manage your finances? Bad news, Mint shut down. The good news, there's a better alternative, Monarch Money. Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and loving it. Why? Because Monarch Money has built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive, insightful, ad-free, and prioritizes the user experience. Try it free for 30 days at monarchmoney.com slash podcast. With a comprehensive view of all your accounts, Monarch makes it easy to stick to your budgets and achieve your goals. Easily customize your dashboard, automate rules for transactions, and more. Monarch's built-in collaboration feature lets you invite your partner at no extra cost. Monarch makes it easy to switch from Mint, import your data, and keep all your tags and categories intact. See why the Wall Street Journal named Monarch Money the best budgeting app overall. Get a 30-day free trial today when you go to monarchmoney.com slash podcast. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H money dot com slash podcast for your free trial. Monarchmoney.com slash podcast. MSW Media. Hello, friends, and welcome to Feminist Buzzkills Live, our special best and third worst of 2021. I mean, we already know that the Texas vigilante bounty hunters and SCOTUS probably ending abortion access as we know it have sealed the top two spots. So we're going with our third worst picks and we've gathered the paltry crumbs of good news we're referring to as the best. And by best, we mean basic ways to fucking live your life. Joining me as always is my fellow buzzkill and co-conspirator Moji Olive-Odale. Hey. Hi, Moj, but our... Normally, our third partner, Marie Khan, is out with the flu, but we have a very special, amazing fill in. <laughs> she is the executive director and founder of the Reproductive Justice Storytelling Collective, We Testify, and is also known around, known around these parts as the Beyonce of abortion storytelling. Please welcome Renee Bracey Sherman. Renee! Hi, Renee! Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for joining us. Um, before we dive into the ugly ab- abyss, let's share our personal best moments of 2021. Uh, Renee, will you kick us off? Yeah. Um, so for our well, personal best, I mean, I'll just say uh, hosting the rally was absolutely amazing this year. Um, it was so good to see all of you there. Um, I think it was it was just a really um, exciting moment to see everybody talking about liberate abortion um, and just for our movement, especially in these dark times. And we've all been at our in homes uh, during the pandemic to really like be out there. So that was actually my highlight. I think what was really, really invigorating and exciting and and wonderful about it was simply that um, we had so many people who had abortions speaking from the stage, right? I hosted the rally in 2020 and then again this year and Obviously, there's there's been a shift over the years, but it's really beautiful to see so many people who've had abortions and providers on the stage sharing our stories, speaking our truths, and just really fucking shut up. I think it's been really, really amazing. Um, and it, it just, I don't know, it, it warms my heart because every single time somebody tells me that they've had an abortion and they finally feel seen and heard and they hear a story like theirs in an article or podcast or you know on Saturday night live with Cecily Strong like that is really what brings all this this um this work um to fruition for me so the rally was that but obviously all the abortion storytelling was absolutely my just like top for the year I think that's awesome. And I also think too, like, I'm just going to straight up say it. Stories are what change hearts and minds. It's not lawyers and law and facts. It just, you know, lawyers stories, but like, it's just true. Like you, you change people's minds by changing their hearts when you tell your abortion story. Um, And you were great at the rally. Mine is very, very low rent. My personal best of this year was uh, going out after 13 months and getting rescuing a dog. 
um, and not being alone in the pandemic. So I drove to Dayton, Ohio, the capital of funk music and rescued a Havanese mix named him Mr. Funk. And he has brought me endless joy. I'm just gonna say my dog has brought me endless joy and keeping me in the fight, Moj. Oh, I think my highlight was uh, also personal. Um, after almost one year of like fully remote and blended learning, I finally got to send my kid to school five days a week. <laughs> it was a deeply personal victory. And all I had to do was wear a mask and get vaccinated for it to happen. And now he's gotten vaccinated too. So it's not hard people to move forward from the pandemic. Just, you know. Yay, science. <laughs> Yay, science. Here we go. Our best and third worst of 2021. Moji, kick it off. All right. So I'd just like to start by saying thanks, COVID. Um, because of the COVID pandemic, abortion telemedicine has expanded to many more states than it was at before. And this is great news because telemedicine allows people to access abortion with minimal disruption in their lives. You can talk to your doctor and they can send abortion pills to you. It's pretty incredible. I mean, why did it take a pandemic for people to realize that abortion should just be this accessible? Because nobody wants to say the word abortion, obviously. But also, why did it take a pandemic for us to realize a lot of these things? <laughs> <laughs> That is fair. That is the that is the that is the broader question, right? Uh, and I think that in these times, especially as we look to see the fate of abortion, how they're making it completely inaccessible to access um, a, an abortion provider, I think the conversation around self-managed abortion and medication abortion is one that we need to have to tell people that these things are safe. These things are part of healthcare. I mean, I've had people who I think are reasonably intelligent people who would fight alongside with me all the time, like still not understand that medication abortion is part of abortion. It's not like some scary thing you do instead of going to a doctor. It's wild. People don't know it exists. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> that every time we post on it on the AAF socials, there's like half the respondents are oh, like, wait, what is this? And I'm like, it's been around since. And they're like, plan B doesn't cause abortions. And I'm like, that's true. We're talking about medication abortion, which does cause abortion. It's right. <laughs> No, it's really wild because I'm like, I feel like we say it all the time and invariably like people are like, wait, this what what sorcery is this? And I'm like, it's just medicine, guys. Break it down, though, Moji, because I think that um, for people who don't know, like they've probably done telemedicine for other parts of their healthcare needs. But like break down a little bit about why this is important and what exactly, you know, it, it how the process is to get medication abortion. So I feel like it, it, you're exactly right when you say that it that they it, people access telemedicine in so many other ways. I can't listen to a podcast without getting an advertisement for th therapy telemedicine. That is just like a thing, right? You get a toothbrush and you get therapy and they can come to your house. Um, and the great thing about telemedicine is rather than than a person who needs an abortion having to find babysitting because most people have, many people have abortions, already have children or have to find parking. Or if you live in Texas or something, having to drive a billion miles, or even if you don't, even if you live near a clinic, having to swim through protesters, like all of these things are barriers that just keep people from accessing, accessing abortion or at least accessing abortion without shame. With this, you can just call a doctor, right? Or a doctor talks to you and then they send the pills to you. And then you have your abortion in the privacy of your own home or somewhere where you feel comfortable without anyone really getting in your business. It's mm -hmm. liberating. And in some states, a nurse practitioner or a certified nurse midwife or a physician's assistant. That's exactly right. It doesn't have to be a doctor. And I think the thing that I love the most about this, and then we're going to move on to your worst, is it 105,000%, that's not a thing, centers the person having the abortion. You get right. to just have your abortion with no interference from any living person. There is no one there. And I well, love what that. a concept to have it on your own terms, on your own time, your own schedule. Like we all have a lot going on. And I mean, I don't know. I don't know about you. I've been trying to get to the post office for about three months because I just can't. Um, and scheduling doctor's appointments, I just can't. And I work in this field, right? So it is really, really difficult, particularly if you 
um, work a job where you don't have flexible hours or, you know, your boss is calling you in, you know, an hour before you were supposed to be on your day off, right? They're just like, just come in to be able to do that on your own schedule at home, I think is, 100%. is really wonderful for um, yep. so many people. Okay, Moj, we got to move on to the, your third worst. What is the third worst story in your mind? The third here? worst are terrifyingly, my third worst is terrifyingly dystopian. Essentially, states are expanding this trend of persecuting pregnant people for having mis miscarriages. So double persecuting people. And it's particularly insidious. It's always insidious, but particularly when they can't even prove that the pregnant person did anything to influence this outcome. So this October, uh, a woman named Brittany Pula, an indigenous woman in Oklahoma, was sentenced to four years in prison because she used methamphetamine while pregnant. And Oklahoma isn't the only place doing this. Alabama's doing it, Tennessee's doing it, California's doing it, just to list some of the places where people have been prosecuted for miscarrying. Um, it's so much to unpack. And again, I think what I wanna be clear is no one can prove or is even sure, not even doctors are sure that the drugs are why she miscarried. But even if they were, miscarriage is not a crime or it shouldn't, shouldn't be. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think this is, again, just a way in which um, the states and governments are trying to control uh, people's pregnancy outcomes. And, and if you don't deliver, quote unquote, a healthy, perfect baby and you don't you don't follow through with continuing the pregnancy in any sort of a way that you are subject to some form of criminalization, some form of interrogation. And um, and even if, you know, it is a, a, a natural miscarriage for whatever reason, you still are, have to go under this like level of suspicion and, and, um, and interrogation. And I think it's wrong. I, I, it is really, really disgusting that um, one, we put people in jail, <laughs> but particularly that we put them in jail for whatever happened to their pregnancy um, and try to hold them responsible no matter what. And I, I think you know, everybody is, is worried about, well, what's going to happen if Roe falls and all this stuff? Well, actually we we're already dealing with it, right. This criminalization piece. And, and, and I think what just grinds my gears is when the antis are like, we're not going to prosecute. We're only prosecuting doctors. We're not going to prosecute people who have abortions. That's a fucking lie. That's so 90s. It's such a fucking lie. Oh, 90s. And, but, but they get away with it, right? And, and they don't have to answer for the fact that they are throwing people in jail or forcing them to continue their pregnancies in jail. And, and I, it just, it really upsets me of how you can sit here and say that, you know, you love them both or pro-life or whatever, um, when you're okay with people living in cages and, and but particularly pregnant folks um, being, you know, uh, prosecuted for how their pregnancy ends or, or having to give birth in shackles. It's, it's really, awful. I mean, Clarence Thomas brought this up in the SCOTUS hearings just last, um, just in the early December when he said like, what if a pregnant person uses cocaine? And it's just like, oh, what so pregnant people aren't people, huh? <laughs> yeah, what right. if they do? And you know, to me too, it's just, I just feel like it can't be said enough that anytime you assign more, if you assign more rights to a fetus, you are taking away rights from that person who is pregnant. There is no way to assign any kind of rights to a fetus without taking away from the pregnant person. And so um, when you start um, trying to find these lanes of delegitimizing the humanity of people who are pregnant, you're, de you're literally giving people license to treat them other than humane. And that to me is the problem. But um, so Moji, those are two really good stories. Um, I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring my, I'm going to bring some noise now with my best. And my best story this year was I'm super proud of Abortion Access Front because through the work that we did um, traveling around and creating these coalitions with very small activists on the ground, we created a, a database of anti-abortion extremists. And through that database, we identified and turned over to the FBI 30 anti-abortion white supremacists who were at the insurrection on January 6th. And I feel really proud of that work. Wow. 
Yeah, that's pretty incredible. I think we had, yeah, as an org, we'd already started making that that connection like oh these white supremacists in front of clinics those are uh definitely they're up to no good and i think uh january 6th really brought that to the forefront for some people who were paying attention or who wanted to hear that fact i'm sorry so you're telling me that anti-abortion people are white supremacists wow Wait, hold on your head's about to explode i can feel your i can feel the steam coming out of your head at this new information. I mean, I know you should have probably heard it from, let's say, um, some white liberal journalist first. Yes. <laughs> or a man. Or some grapes and man. There's some a man, man who would have told you that. It's just so yeah. fascinating because they never say racist things outside of the clinic or when they're like, you know, yelling at us. It's such a surprise to me. I yeah. you mean. They you never don't treat black people like shit when we work on abortion. Oh, you don't think that uh the black woman's womb isn't the least safe place to be in America? <laughs> I've seen uh, it on a billboard. It must be true. <laughs> I've yelled in my face a couple times, and I just nod. <laughs> I know it's uh, it, but you know, at least you know we've been sort of like you know man screaming at clouds about this, <laughs> but. When, when, you know, we have just been tracking these um, and we have accounts that are undercover in their churches, hearing them talk about Christian uprisings and hearing them talk about it, it's, uh, I, I really am excited to be pushing forward this information. Um, we're creating an incredible database that providers can use um, to type in who is outside of their clinic and they can pull reports on their histories and where they're going. So that to me is really good news to help in the fight for security and the fight for exposing people and hopefully people to understand that intersectionality of hatred is very real. So that is my good news. My scary ass news or the, the third worst story is while we've been bemoaning uh, Texas, South Carolina pulled some rank shit where uh, let's, it's sort of like the Texas, it has all the joy of the Texas abortion ban, six week garbage garb. And um, instead of having a bounty hunting piece, what the, what the joy they've added is that if you have an abortion uh, and you were, uh, and your pregnancy occurred from sexual assault, rape or incest, and you happen to tell your doctor that, your doctor is required by law to report your sexual assault, whether you want them to or not, to the authorities. And um, the governor was very excited to sign it into law, very thrilled. The sheriff of the, of, of the county was like, I am not here for this. I am not a sheriff to police people's bodies. How dare you? But the legislature and the governor of South Carolina um, were also excited. And here's what's wild. 20 attorneys general from 20 states and the District of Columbia band together to say, we this law is aberrant and we oppose this law. And so we're gonna wait for a hearing on that, but it sailed through and got passed. The governor signed it. And in early 2022, I'm sure they're waiting on all everything, SCOTUS, uh, Mississippi, Texas, everything, but um, it's going through the court system and we'll find out how the lower court will rule on this case, but it's appalling. I mean, what our two uh, worst have in common is revictimization of pregnant people. Right. I, I mean, think, really, I, I think I think what's what's upsetting is this. They they tried to do this this mantle of like, oh, we'll address rape, whatever. Right. We heard Texas um, Governor Abbott say, well, we don't need a rape incest, you know, ex um, carve out in any of these laws because we're going to end rape. And it's just this, I, this, I know, <laughs> like, okay, sir. Like we're going to end abortion. First Why don't we do that already? Abortion. We don't need to, like, you can't end things when people are just, there's a subset of people who are intrinsically garbage. Right. And I, and I think, again, it, it's all based in this, like the patriarch, this patriarchal view of, of we're a savior. We're going to, we're going to fix it all but we're actually not going to listen to what the people who are most impacted need. Um, and, and what happens when police officers harm people, right? We know that police officers are extremely violent. Um, DV rates are skyrocketing, right? And um, they are often raping people who are in their custody, right? 
So what happens then? Because we have no police accountability. Again, it is it is just creating more ways in which they can pretend like they are addressing something in the system, but just re-traumatizing, as you said, Moji, and just really doing shit, diddly squat, and yeah. not the full list where we said, hey, here are the things we'd like you to do. They're like, cool, none of that. I have a ridiculous <laughs> idea to do that. Well, also too, during the pandemic, we saw this massive spike of people who, when we went into lockdown, who were locked down with their abusers and couldn't get out and didn't have a place to go and, and found themselves pregnant and right. didn't want to be, were having a hard time accessing abortion. And so it's like these, there's a jillion situations in which um, people should be like just throwing things at Greg Abbott when he says shit like that. And like the fact that people aren't up in arms about the fact that um, you would take the um, decision of whether or not you want to report your sexual assault out of that person's hands. Like just everything right. is being taken out of our hands now and including that. And um, that's a sad direction that it's, we need to fall back like so hard. on. It's also so much of like, I think that a lot of what the anti-choice movement tries to do is insert themselves or the state between doctors and patients, right? Yeah. So like, even when there are laws, it's like, well, doctors can't do this. And then it's like, well, doctors can't do their jobs. And you are with no medical knowledge at all, just mandating how like medicine works, but you don't know how medicine works because I mean, you're not Joe like, Rogan. Like, <laughs> come on. I guess right, we I'm, have to move on to Renee. Renee, okay, well, I was gonna say real quick, one thing I'm good. I was gonna say, how do they go from these hoes be lying every time somebody comes forward with a rape story to no, you have to report your stuff to the police. Yeah, Wait, the lion hoes have to report their stuff. <laughs> but, right. <laughs> anyway, okay, my best. So um, one that I thought was really, really exciting comes, uh, a two-parter comes from Portland, Oregon. Um, so earlier this year, uh, they had, um, they enacted a policy offering paid leave for um, city employees who are experiencing miscarriages and abortions. And so that way they can have paid time off uh, to be able to tend to whatever their needs are. It's for three days. I think it should be more, but hey, we'll take it. It's a start. So it's super, super exciting that um, as the city is trying to make sure that their employees have what they need um, and understanding that after a miscarriage or an abortion, whatever it is that um, somebody might not be able to come to work right away. Um, and they also just might need time to actually go and get the care that they need. So that's super exciting. And then um, a huge Wait. shout out to the Northwest Abortion Access Fund, uh, because they also worked with the city council to get a pot of money, $200,000 uh, for their fund to make sure that folks in Portland are able to access and afford their abortions. And a super shout out to Beth Vile, who's a board member at the Northwest Abortion Access Fund. She's a staff member here at We Testify. She shared her story of having to actually travel out of Oregon, which has no laws on abortion, but because she needed a later abortion, um, still like wasn't able to get it in the state and had to travel to New Mexico for care. So she shared her story and um, it really pushed them over the edge. So shout out to the Northwest Abortion Access Fund, really doing amazing proactive legislation um, to ensure, you know, people who have abortions are really supported in all the ways that they need to be. I love um, that this idea that like, regardless of pregnancy outcome, people need care. What yeah. a wild concept. I wish we could all embrace that. <laughs> right. I, know. I, I totally agree. And I feel like too, like, I think Renee, it, it's, I think it really goes to, to repeating that Oregon is, is singly the most liberal state on abortion access, but if somebody isn't providing the care and there's so few people that provide later abortion care that in a state that welcomes it, there's not a provider there. Like right. that's just one of those gaping holes that we don't talk about. But I also want to shout out the governor of Oregon, who is a fellow Minnesotan. What? Hey. I'm always looking to shout out Minnesota. <laughs> Kathleen Brown. She is so great. She has been on the forefront of, of what we want out of our legislators. It's not enough to just stop anti-abortion legislation. You, it's like anti-racism. You have to be forward in expanding access to abortion. So go, 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 Oregon. Awesome. All right. 
bring the dump, bring the bad news. Renee, what is it? Well, the bad news. Um, so <laughs> Texas's uh, seven week ban on medication abortion went into effect earlier uh, in December. Um, it was, it kind of happened in the shadow of the oral arguments at the Supreme Court. And, and you might be thinking, I'm confused. You said seven weeks, Renee, and you said medication abortion. Didn't Texas ban abortion at six weeks? And yes, you are correct. They are putting them all on top of each other in case that six week ban can, uh, we're able to get rid of that. They are trying to ban, um, they're banning abortion, uh, medication abortion after seven weeks. Reason it can't really get challenged in the courts? Well, because then somebody would have to say that they're providing a medication abortion up to seven weeks, which is in violation of the other law that bans abortion at six weeks. You also might be thinking, that's interesting, Renee, because I thought medication abortion works up to at least 10 weeks, maybe even further. Is that true? And I'd say, yes, you are correct. It does. But they don't give a shit about science. And really what this is, is it's actually a dig at uh, the, the uh, Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, which is um, looking at removing the REMS for medication abortion. Um, we should hopefully, by the time this comes out, hear about whether or not um, they're going to get rid of some of these um, restrictions that require it to be given in a clinic and not dispensed in a pharmacy, for example. Um, so this is Texas is, is kind of one of the more um, egregious ones where there are several states like Arizona that is requiring the state uh, or requires providers to dispense medication abortion like on label or according to outdated um, recommendations by the FDA. So they are really, really, really clinging to the no science, no data. We're not going to follow what any research says. Um, and it's just really disappointing, uh, particularly for folks who are trying to help folks self-manage on the ground uh, in Texas and across the country. Nobody Texas. ices a shit cake like Texas. I was going to say. <laughs> Unbelievable. Texas is like, we have a huge litigation budget, I guess. We don't need infrastructure. Let's spend all our money in litigation because essentially the minute this six weeks whatever is happening happens, then all oh, someone's going to be able to say, oh, now we got to start this seven week litigation. Like the state of Texas has so much money to spend arguing. I, I love the way you just laid that out, Renee, too, because they know that they're probably going to have the six week ban be repealed. So they just, they just made sure that they had on tap and, and, and in everybody's glass, a seven week ban. And man, that is some sneaky ass shit. I just always wonder like, 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 and I, and I, I guess I mean this like with the vitriol that is, but like, you know, scrabble something you could do. Like you, know, <laughs> you could do any fucking other hobby. And like, what kind of human literally has their hobby 24 seven plotting, planning, waking up, doing it again. Watch Ted Lasso for fuck's sake. Like Truly. oppressing <laughs> pregnant people is all you do. Like if we, maybe we could just do an abortion channel where people could binge it all day and we could fool them into thinking they were being oppressive. They just get to, I don't know. Like, but they just need to shut the fuck up. It's just wild that a state that literally had no power like months ago, that was also 2021. It's like, you know what we have time to do? All the bullshit. <laughs> I know, I know. The, well, the Ray, thing that gets, well, the thing that gets me too is that they sit there and they're like, we don't want our tax dollars to fund abortions or to pay for abortions. But it literally does with all of this, legisl this legislation that you know, they have to fight. It goes into the legal bills. It is a complete waste of money for the entire state of Texas and all the taxpayers who care about where their money goes. And that's true for all of the states that that keep pulling up this like illegal anti roe bullshit. Anyway, <laughs> Renee, thank you so much for reliving the trauma of 2021 with us and for bringing your right spots. <laughs> Coming up next, Liz talks to Greg Proops, one of the few dudes we want to hear from on abortion. But first, enjoy some fake commercials because heaven forbid a real product would pay the abortion bills.
sure, it, it, it's all fine in the moment, isn't it? But it hits you, it hits you. Maybe the next day, maybe 10, 15, 20 years later, you're not alone. I was a mess after my masturbation. I, I just cried and cried for days. It's okay. I think we've all been there. It's, it's like hearing your own life story told over and over again. I, I don't know if anyone else is married here, but you can't imagine what it's like knowing that you could have had hundreds of thousands of babies with your wife and that you didn't because you were so selfish uh, that you had to think of yourself first and not of, you know, other people. And uh, I, I can't help but feeling that I'm doing wrong. Uh, and uh, I haven't even told my wife, although I'm, I'm, how could she not know? You know what I mean? Uh, she hasn't had any babies and she's had the opportunity to have several million. Even if we believe that what we did was wrong, or it if we, wrong. If we don't wrong. believe it's wrong, we, we still feel guilty about having done it. How do we move past this, gentlemen? The, the society's so permissive. I mean, you look around and, you know, Hollywood stars and, and, and politicians, you know, you, you have Anthony Weiner and Bill Clinton and they make it seem cool and fun for everybody. And, and, and then, you know, how are we supposed to react to that when we know it's wrong? I don't know if I can ever get over the shame. I mean, or if I want to. What's up everybody? It's me, Todd Chapman, leader of the Bro Life Movement, because there's a bro in every embryo. This is a big day for bros everywhere. We are finally going to codify telling women what they can do with their bodies. All my best friends are here. Everybody, come, come, check it out. Greg's in the house. Greg, Greg. We got Tanya. She doesn't get out of the house that much, but it was a nice day. Talking clear. Claire is a jokester. Jimmy, that's my boy. Another Jessica. There's probably about 60 Jessicas in my crew. That's Trevor. He's the shy one. Uncle Gary. Nobody likes this dude. Every fetus matters. Kevin, hey dog. One week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. All the way up until 40 weeks. After that, it's sort of out of our hands. Another Jessica. All these posters are true. They're fact checked. They're, none of them are rendered differently or whatever you try to say. He's a machine that's good enough to press that penny into a commemorative point. Did I do that? We got your back on board, maybe babies. We got you. Coming up next, a dude who has shown up to fight for every single one of my abortions. That's right. He is dope. He is part of the Who's Line Is It Anyway crew, and his smartest man in the world pod is hilarious. Please welcome the one and only Greg Proops. Hi, friend. Hi, Liz Winstead. How are you, darling? You know, I think I'm feeling. Uh, I'm feeling fairly well. Uh, how are you doing? I'm much better than I was. Uh, I'm uh, reasonably sober today, so that's a good sign. And uh, uh, I'm, I've also been sort of productive, which is nice. The first thing I wanted to ask you about is, how would you help us explain to cis men and others that it is part of their responsibility to defend the human rights of people with uteruses? Well. Uh, being simple with guys is uh, also tricking is good. Uh, humor, you know, like I'm in a group with a bunch of guys and um, I've convinced them over the 20 years we've been together to join me in a bunch of my, you know, they'll like a tweet that I'll do that's political. They'll, you know, but to get them to march or to get them to do stuff was a real push, you know. And it's taken me a long time. And these are guys are my colleagues and friends. You know, I'm in a group with them. It's the Who's Line guys. And in the last couple of years, buddy, I've gotten them to do spots for me for the ACLU for pro-choice. I've gotten them to do a campaign. We campaigned for Warnock and Ossoff last year and raised like $300,000. We did a Zoom thing with all the Who's Line guys. So it's just gradually beating them down and, and trying to appeal to the better angels of their nature. Now, mind you, several of them have daughters and wives. You know that old, oh, since I had a daughter, I finally understand you shouldn't treat women like shit. It had I, never that is, occurred That's the to thing me. that drives me insane. <laughs> like, until I had a daughter, treating women like shit was A-okay. No, it's just how I worked, you know? So I, I think uh, information at the end of the day with intelligent people 
who are able to process it uh, is the best way. Just a constant flow of humor, the way you do it, a constant flow of humor, a constant flow of facts, 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 facts. Abortion isn't evil. Abortion is a necessity. Women's health is a right. It's not an abstract thing. Uh, in Mississippi and West Virginia, and uh, uh, I assure you in the Dakotas, wherever, the problem isn't that women are sitting around thinking, how can I kill a baby today? The problem is women are thinking, I need to put three squares on the table. I need diapers. I need a toothbrush. I need to go to the dentist. I need a ride. They need those basic things. And that's what these women's clinics are doing. So when I explain it to people that way, all of a sudden I see them, the sagacity, right? All of a sudden they, huh, I've never thought of that before. And literally there's a world full of people who've never thought of that before. Women are just like you. And they need a ride to the doctor. How does that grab you? That they don't literally not sit around plotting to kill babies. No one does that. It's it's literally basic human rights that we're talking about here. I mean, to get people to understand that trans people are people, that it's not a decision they made. To get people to understand that gay people are people, that people who are uh, have special needs doesn't make them a different person. One of the great levelers of this containment has been that I think we've had to recognize that people who couldn't leave the house or are immune deficient or, or, or they physically couldn't or whatever the reason is, now we're all in their boat. And so they had it their way for a year. All of a sudden, now you see how I have to work. I have to have stuff delivered. I have to talk to people over the phone like this. And it privileged cis white guys take more fucking <laughs> indoctrinating than any humans alive. Yeah, It's easy to say to them, uh, the election was fake, put on a mankini and a Viking hat and grab a hatchet and some bear spray and join me because we're going to party. Yeah, Because the appeal to violence is always fun. It's like a rodeo or a, a football game where you get to participate. Um, but the hard goddamn nuts and bolts work of getting women their rights is something that is not easily solved in a tweet or things like that. It's frustrating to me, as it is to you, that we can't get all the male comics to just come along and do this. Why don't they understand? Mm -hmm. Any of whom have daughters and wives and mothers. I'm hoping for a day where men send me an email and say, I really want to get out on the road with you guys and do some work instead of me having to hound people. And you've been paving the way for that, Mr. Proops. And um, I want to thank you. Tell people where they can find you all over the uh, interwebs. Thank you. Uh, Yes, I'm at gregproops.com and uh, direct me, I think is some sort of link. It's on my Instagram. I'm on Instagram at Proop Dog. I'm on Twitter at Greg Proops. Uh And I love that you are part of the Abortion Access Front Squad. Thank you, my friend. Thank you for having me, my darling. Check out gregproops.com to find out where he is doing all of his prooping. And you can find the Smartest Man in the World pod wherever you do your potting. Okay, so normally we would take some time right now to give our show reflections, but since tomorrow is New Year's Eve, let's give some predictions. Renee? Well, my 2022 prediction is, it's a wild one, that President Joseph R. Biden will actually say the word abortion using his own two lips from his mouth, he will actually do it. Not some of the statement written by his staffers. I believe that Joe Biden can say abortion. We're going to put $20 on this. One. I was going to say. I'm going to put money on this with you. All I right. want to take that back. Uh, <laughs> I say no. <laughs> well, I think in 2022, they're going to start subpoenaing Tinder, his Tinder histories because they'll decide the conception actually starts at the first swipe. It's my prediction. Yeah, that, I think that's fair. Um, <laughs> yeah. My prediction in 2022 is that all aborted fetuses will be required by law to be given a full military burial with a 21 gun salute. And the person who got the abortion will have to pay for it. (laughs) I believe will be happening in 2022. All right. Not that positive, but let's be real. 
Uh, we are here. We are joyful. We are doing the work. Um, Renee, I just want to thank you again so much. It's such a joy to have you here. And thank you, Greg Proops. A reminder, we're taking next week off, but back with new episodes January 13th. So in the meantime, you can keep up with all the latest news about the invasive species trying to get up all in your junk by following Abortion Access Front on all the socials at Abortion Front. And last chance to donate to Abortion Access Front in 2021. Your donation will be matched by a wonderful human. So give now and give again. aafront.org slash give AF. And finally, as we head into 2022, we want to take this time to remind you that guys like this one, who's about to show you his whole ass, vote in every election. May he be the jolt you need to get off your ass and take to the streets in 2022. Happy New Year! Get Happy well, Year. Marie. Get well, Bye. Marie. Bye. Thank you, Renee. Happy New Year. Bye. <laughs> Eternal souls woven into earthen vessels, sanctified by Almighty God and endowed with the miracle of life are denied their birth by a nation that was born in freedom. God's breath of life blown away by the breath of man. This cruel and fallen world may seem too filthy for their very presence, but these precious temples are crafted in the image of God himself. One day, perhaps when science darkens the soul of the left, our nation will repent. But until then, the carnage of this unconscionable deed will stain the fabric of our nation. I hope that the Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade. I hope that we stop the, uh, the genocide of abortion in this country. Feminist Buzzkills Live is a production of Abortion Access Front. Subscribe to our YouTube at aafront.org slash fbksub.